Wow, we are going to learn so many cool things on this homeschool pop video. All right, what's the first thing we should learn? How about earthquakes? And the first thing we need to understand is the Earth has an outer shell. Isn't that interesting? This outer shell is called the crust. Crust, you know, like you know, like bread crust. And I, I hope you enjoy bread crust, by the way, because you can't eat the crust of the earth. But I hope that you're eating the bread crust. You know, it's still yummy. It's on the outside. In fact, it's really healthy. It's really great. Okay, let's get back to the crust of the earth. You know, you don't eat the earth's crust, but hopefully you eat this kind of crust. Okay. The surface of the earth is part of this outer shell. Remember, the outer shell is called the crust. This means that hills, mountains, and valleys are all part of the Earth's crust. That means even the floor of the ocean is part of the Earth's crust. <laughs> Woohoo! So what is the outer shell of the Earth? Yeah, the crust. And you know, it's fascinating. The crust has lots of pieces and is almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And you might not realize this, but these pieces of crust are always moving. In fact, they're moving right now. The pieces of crust that are below you right now are moving. They're always moving. Now, usually the crust moves slowly. It doesn't move very fast. When the crust moves slowly, you don't feel it. The pieces are moving beneath you, but you don't even know because they're moving very, very slowly. You can't even feel it. Sometimes, however, the pieces of crust can move really fast. They can move quickly. When the pieces of crust are moving quickly, an earthquake can happen. So when the pieces of crust move slowly, you don't feel it. But when the pieces of crust move quickly, you could have an earthquake. Earthquakes begin under Earth's surface and shake the ground. Here's a picture of something that can happen when there's an earthquake. Do you see the massive cracks in the ground? This is from an earthquake. The earthquake began under the Earth's surface. It shook the ground and it caused this crack. Oh my goodness, look at this picture that shows damage from an earthquake. See, earthquakes can also break down buildings, bridges, and roads. They don't just cause cracks in the ground. They break all kinds of things around us. Earthquakes are so powerful, they can change Earth's surface. Well, you may be wondering, where do earthquakes start? Earthquakes start underground at a place called the Focus. You can see it here on the picture. Now, that's a weird name for it, I know. It's called a Focus. We don't know why, but that's just the way it is. It's called the Focus. It's where the earthquake starts. The earthquake is the strongest at the spot above the Focus called the Epicenter. You can see from the picture it's directly above. When an earthquake happens, you don't want to be anywhere near the epicenter. While earthquakes are very powerful, they don't last that long. In fact, most earthquakes last less than a minute. And remember, a minute is 60 seconds. It's not too long. And did you know this earthquake fact? Earthquakes get scored by how strong they are. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Earthquakes get their own score, their own number. Scientists use seismographs to measure and score earthquakes. The bigger the number, the stronger the earthquake. So here are some common earthquake scores. A one or a two earthquake, you barely feel it. 
the three to six range of earthquakes, there are going to be some damage. But seven plus, any number that's seven or higher for an earthquake score, that's a massive earthquake, and there's going to be tons of damage. Remember, the Earth has an outer shell, and this outer shell is called the crust. The crust has lots of pieces, and it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle, and all the pieces are always moving. But if they move too fast, that can cause an earthquake, and an earthquake changes the Earth's surface and can damage roads, bridges, buildings, and even crack up the Earth. And remember, the earthquake is the strongest at the spot above the focus called the epicenter. You don't want to be anywhere near the epicenter if an earthquake was to happen. Thanks for learning about earthquakes with us, a powerful way that Earth's surface changes. You're doing great. You're increasing your skills just like this racer, you know, racing on the water. You're increasing your skills. You're doing a wonderful job. And next, we are going to learn about the plant parts and their functions. Okay, so plants have six parts. All right, so how many plant parts are there? <laughs> yeah, six. There are six plant parts. The first three help plants get water, make food, and grow. They are roots, stems, and leaves. The second three help plants grow new plants. They are flowers, fruit, and seeds. So let's learn the plant parts one by one. First, the parts that help the plant get water, make food, and grow. Okay, so the first plant part we're going to look at today are the roots. Roots have a special job. You see, roots hold the plant in the soil. The soil is the dirt in the ground. Then, roots bring water and nutrients from the soil to the plant. Roots are usually underground, but can be above ground too. Have you ever seen a tree that looks like this, where the roots are above ground? Remember, the roots hold the plant to the soil. Okay, so now we're going to look at the second part of a plant, which are the stems. Now the stems hold the plant up above ground. The stems carry water and food through the plant. Stems are the delivery system of the plant. Roots get water and nutrients from the soil, and the stems carry the water and nutrients throughout the plant. Remember, the stem holds the plant above ground. The next part of the plant we're going to learn today are leaves. The leaves are on the end of the stems of plants. And this is interesting. Leaves are where plants make most of their food. 
leaves take in air, and they use air, water, and sunlight to make food. Remember, leaves are on the end of the stems. Okay, so next, the parts that help the plant make new plants. The next part we're going to look at are flowers. Flowers, like leaves, grow on the end of the stems. Flowers are often the most colorful part of the plant. Okay, now this is awesome. The rich colors of flowers help attract pollinators. That's why they're beautiful. The beauty has a purpose. After getting pollinated, flowers can make seeds and fruit. Do you love fruit? Yes, fruit is awesome! You have flowers to thank for that. Flowers make fruit. So the next time you're eating an amazing piece of fruit, just think to yourself, oh, thank you, flowers. Thank you, flowers. Remember, flowers are the colorful growths on the stems. The next part of the plant we're going to learn about is the fruit. Alright, now where on the plant is the fruit? Fruit hangs on the end of stems. Now, you might be wondering, what's the fruit's job? What does the fruit do? Well, the fruit's job is to hold the seeds. The fruit is just a delicious seed holder. Now either one of two things happens to fruit. Fruit is either picked and eaten, or it falls off the plant and rots. Remember, fruit is the tasty stuff on the stems. Okay, the last part of the plant that we're going to learn today are the seeds. So where are the seeds of the plant? Seeds hide inside of the fruit. Now the seeds have an incredible job. You see, seeds grow into new plants. Okay, you might be wondering, well, how does that work? Well, here's one way. When animals eat fruit, they eat the seeds. Later, the seeds leave the animal through its waste wherever the animal is. This is called dispersal. Or, fruit falls from the tree and rots. The word rots means dies. The fruit dies. It rots. The seeds fall out and can make a new plant. The first way, called dispersal, takes the seed to another place so it plants a new plant in a new place. When a fruit falls and rots, it plants a new plant nearby the original plant. Remember, seeds live inside of the fruit. Hey, it looked like you were doing a good job paying attention, learning about the plant parts, and now we want to see how much you learned. We're going to play a game called Name the Plant Part. We're going to show you a plant part and then you go ahead and tell us which plant part it is all right hope you're ready because here we go look at this picture of a plant which plant part is colored in uh-huh the fruit the fruit of this 
plant. Great job. Here's the next one. What plant part is colored in? Yeah, the leaves. The leaves are colored in. Great job. All right, it's time for this one. It's colored brown. Which plant part is this? Uh-huh, the roots. Awesome. Okay, let's try this one. What part of the plant is colored in? Do you see it there on the bottom? What is that? Yeah, what part is that? Yes, the seed. Let's try this one. Look at the picture. Could you name the plant part? Which plant part is that? You can see it's outlined in color. Yeah, the flowers. Awesome job. Oh, this little baby's putting together a little craft. You know, oh, it's so great. I just love that. That's, that's so good. Wait a second. That... That paper's from that book, isn't it? Okay, this is, see, this is, this is not an approved arts and crafts activity right now. Um, okay, we're gonna have to take care of this, but first, let's learn about solids and liquids. Solid and liquid are states of matter. Matter is anything that takes up space. Now, matter comes in different states or forms. There's solid, there's liquid, and there's gas. Today, we are focusing on solids and liquids and how to classify them. We're going to start with solids. Matter is a solid when it has its own shape. Let's show you. So here are some examples of solids. Remember, matter is a solid when it has its own shape. Here is a coat. A coat is an example of a solid. It has its own shape. It's an interesting shape. It's the shape of a coat, but it has its own shape. It's a solid. Here's another one. Here's a laptop computer. It's an example of a solid. It has its own shape. It has its own shape. It's a solid piece of matter. Here's another solid, a scooter. An electric scooter that looks really awesome and fun to ride. Anyway. It's a solid, right? It has its own shape. It's a solid. Oh, I love making these. A paper airplane is an example of a solid. It is matter that has its own shape. It's a solid. Matter is a solid when it has its own shape. Now let's learn about liquids. Matter is a liquid when it takes the shape of its container. Here are some examples of liquids. Our first is water, and notice how we had to have it in a bottle in this picture because it doesn't have its own shape. It takes the shape of its container because water is a liquid. Here's another liquid, honey. Honey takes the shape of its container. It's not solid, it's liquid, 
It takes the shape of its container. It doesn't have its own shape. It's a liquid. Here's the last example of a liquid. It's coffee and it's in this cup. It's taking the shape of the cup because it's a liquid. It doesn't have a shape. Matter is a liquid when it takes the shape of its container. Alright, so solids have their own shape, and liquids take the shape of their container. Alright, I think you're ready. I think you're ready to handle this. We're going to play a quick game to figure out if these items are solid or liquid. So I hope you'll help me out. I hope you'll participate because we need to figure this out. Our first one, juice. Solid or liquid? Yeah, juice is a liquid. It takes the shape of its container. How about this? A cup. Is a cup solid or liquid? Yeah, it's solid. It has its own shape. Let's try milk. Is milk a liquid or solid? Yeah, milk is a liquid. It takes the shape of its container. How about this one? Honey. Is honey a liquid or a solid? Yeah, it's a liquid. It takes the shape of its container. Let's try a car. Is a car a solid or a liquid? Is it a liquid or a solid? It's a solid. It has its own shape. Great job. How about shampoo? Is shampoo a solid or a liquid? Uh-huh. Shampoo is a liquid. It takes the shape of its container. Solids have their own shape. Liquids take the shape of their container. Okay, that was pretty cool. You seem to know a lot about solids and liquids now. So the next time you're drinking something or you're holding something, you can say to yourself, I know what this is. Here's our friend Fred. We heard that he just took up the harp. He just started playing the harp. Fred, we can't we can't hear you. We're having audio problems with Fred right now. Fred, you look so happy playing. We we can't hear you, okay? You got you got to wear your mic or something. We can't hear the music. Oh, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. Isn't that nice? You know, Fred is just plucking away. He's having a good time. You know, kind of like we're having a good time right now with these learning videos. And next, we are going to learn about the planets of the solar system. Now, as we begin, we have to answer this question. What are planets? Huh, this is a really good question. What are planets? Planets are round objects that orbit the sun. Here is a picture of the sun. It's the largest star in our solar system. It's massive. And you can see there's a ring around it. Those are some solar flares, fire shooting out of the sun. Absolutely amazing and stunning. And it kind of looks like a pizza, actually. I'm Kind of gets me hungry. I don't know. Doesn't it look like a cheese pizza? <laughs> it looks really yummy. The word orbit means to circle around. That means planets are round objects that circle around the sun. Hey, what 3D shape is a planet? Think about it. What 3D shape is a planet? We know that a planet is round. What 3D shape is perfectly round? Yeah, a sphere. Yeah, planets are spheres. They're perfectly round. Yeah, good job. To summarize, planets are spheres that go around the sun. Pretty simple, huh? Hey, did you know there are two types of planets? Yeah, it's really interesting. There are two types of planets. 
Okay, so there are primary planets and there are dwarf planets. Those are the two types of planets. Now there are eight primary planets. These are the main planets that you think of, the main planets that are circling around the sun, and these are the planets we're going to be studying in this video. And then there are five dwarf planets. These planets are a lot smaller and are not considered primary planets. <laughs> Sorry, Pluto. Wow, well, there they are, the primary planets. You're going to get to know all eight of these primary planets. You're going to know them so well. Oh my goodness, this is going to be awesome. The first planet is Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. The second planet is Venus. Pretty cool, huh? The second planet is Venus. Our planet, Earth, is the third planet from the sun. The fourth planet is Mars. Mars is the fourth planet. The fifth planet is Jupiter. That's the biggest planet of them all. The sixth planet is Saturn. You gotta love those rings. Saturn is the sixth planet. Uranus is the seventh planet. And the eighth planet is Neptune. Neptune is the furthest primary planet from the Sun. Let's look at each of the eight primary planets. The first planet is Mercury. Here's where Mercury is. It is the closest planet to the Sun, okay? And the Sun is super duper hot, so guess what? Mercury is a really, really hot planet. In fact, Mercury is four times hotter than boiling water. Have you ever seen boiling water? It's so hot. It's boiling. It can cook things. It's really, really hot. If you barely touch it, you will hurt yourself so bad. Well, Mercury is four times hotter than that. Oh, my goodness. It is a very hot planet. Four times hotter than boiling water. Mercury is one of the rocky planets. There are four rocky planets, and Mercury is one of them. Oh, and Mercury, it is the smallest primary planet. Mercury is so much smaller than the other planets. Tiny little, little baby Mercury. It's the smallest planet of the primary planet. So if you think of a small planet, think of Mercury. It's small. It's hot. You wouldn't want to live there. The next planet, planet two, is Venus. Venus is right here. It's the second planet from the sun. Now this is interesting. Venus is called Earth's twin. And the reason for that is they are a very similar size. They're almost the same size. And what's interesting, they're both rocky planets, just like Mercury is. And Earth and Venus are made of similar rocks. So they're pretty much the same size, very similar size, and they're made of the same stuff. It's almost like the Earth and the planet Venus are twins. Hey, did you know every day on Venus is a cloudy day? And the clouds are yellow! Oh, that's such a gross color for clouds. <laughs> Clouds are much better when they're other colors than yellow, so the sunlight doesn't actually hit the surface of Venus. It's just a cloudy day, every day, forever, but that's okay because there's no life on Venus, so nobody's crying about it. And this is cool. Venus is the closest planet to Earth. It is the easiest planet to see in the sky. You don't even need a telescope. How cool is that? The third planet is, well, ours, the Earth. The Earth is the third planet. Here is where the Earth is. Yep, it's the third planet from the sun. By the way, these planets never line up like this. We just have it like this so you can see the order of the planets, but they're normally very, very jumbled. They don't line up like this. Just wanted to share that. But the Earth is the third planet from the sun. 
Here's a picture of the ocean and some seagulls that are in some of the shallow parts of the water. It's interesting. Earth is the only planet we know of that has oceans and life on it. Earth is one of the rocky planets. Yeah, we live on a massive rock that has oceans, that has life. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. Remember, four of the planets are rocky planets. Earth has one moon. The moon orbits the Earth like the Earth orbits the Sun. Wow, there's our planet. <laughs> That's where we live, the Earth. The fourth planet is Mars. Mars is right here, in between Earth and Jupiter. What color is Mars? Look at Mars. What color is that? Yeah, it's kind of like a reddish, orange. Because of its color, Mars is called the Red Planet. So if anyone asks you what's the Red Planet, tell them, hey, the Red Planet is Mars. Even though it is red, it is not hot. It is much colder than Earth because remember, Mars is further from the sun than the Earth. So Mars, it's red, it almost looks like it would be hot, but it's cold. Hey, is there life on Mars? That's a really good question that a lot of scientists have been trying to answer for a long time. Well, scientists believe there used to be water on Mars. If there was water, there may have been life, and even stranger, there are some scientists that believe we may still find basic forms of life still living on Mars. Mars is the fourth rocky planet. Remember, we said there are only four rocky planets, so it's the last of the rocky planets. Mars has volcanoes and valleys just like Earth. They're just sometimes much bigger. In fact, there's a volcano on Mars that's as big as the state of Texas. Wow, <laughs> huge. And this is kind of cool. Mars has two moons. They are both very small, okay? They're small moons, which is good. You know, Mars has a couple moons. It's nice. We've got a moon. Mars has two moons, you know? Mars is the fourth planet from the sun, and it's in between the Earth and Jupiter. The fifth planet is Jupiter. Jupiter, the first of the gas planets. Here is where Jupiter is. It's the massive planet between Mars and Saturn. I mean, Jupiter is huge. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. In fact, all of the other planets could fit in Jupiter and there would be extra room. All of the other planets could fit inside of Jupiter. That's how big Jupiter is. And this is amazing. Jupiter has at least 63 moons. And we say at least because they're still discovering more. Wow. And because Jupiter is a gas planet, if you ever visited it, you would just fall right through. Just kidding. You would float. I mean, you, they wouldn't fall. The gravity wouldn't be there. You would just kind of float around and, you know. Jupiter is the giant gas planet in between Mars and Saturn. The sixth planet is Saturn. Another gas planet. Here is Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. You could spot it easily because of those huge rings, and it's in between Jupiter and Uranus. Hey, did you know Saturn's rings are made of ice? <laughs> oh my goodness, how cool that must be! Whew. Whew, icy rings! Those rings are made of ice! Wow! Like Jupiter, Saturn has a lot of moons. 
Saturn has 62 moons. Wow, tons and tons of moons. What's up with Jupiter and Saturn, right? And this is pretty awesome. Saturn is the farthest planet you can see without a telescope. That's right, you can see Saturn with your own eyes without a telescope. Look, Mommy and Daddy, I see Saturn with my own eyes. <laughs> yes, Saturn, I see the rings and everything. Saturn is a gas planet that's the sixth planet from the Sun and is in between Jupiter and Uranus. The seventh planet is Uranus, another gas planet. Uranus is the seventh planet from the Sun and is in between Saturn and Neptune. Both Uranus and Neptune are the only planets you can't see without a telescope, so it took a while for them to be discovered. Now this is neat. William Herschel discovered Uranus in 1781. It took us a long time to finally find the planet Uranus. Uranus is a gas planet that is made of gas and liquid. What's cool is Uranus has rings just like Saturn has rings. Yeah. Scientists believe the rings of Uranus could be pieces of broken moons. We don't know for sure, but that's really fascinating if that's the case. Speaking of moons, Uranus has 27 moons. 27 moons! I mean, we just have one, you know, 27. Uranus is the seventh planet from the Sun and is in between Saturn and Neptune. The eighth and final planet is Neptune. Hey, that means the first four planets are rocky planets and the last four planets are gas planets. So here is where Neptune is. It's the furthest planet from the Sun. Like Uranus, Neptune is a gas planet that is also made of liquid. Neptune was discovered in 1846 when Uranus was being studied. They were like, wait a second, there's a whole other planet here on the end. Let's call it Neptune. Neptune is known for its storms, the worst storms in the solar system. In fact, winds reach over 1,000 miles per hour on Neptune. Woo! That's pretty intense. Neptune has 14 known moons, but scientists believe there may be more. Here's Neptune, the furthest planet from the Sun. You have done such an amazing job with us today. Today we learned planets are round objects that orbit the Sun. The word orbit means to circle around. Basically, the planets are round objects that go around the Sun. We learned there are two types of planets, primary planets, and there are eight primary planets, and dwarf planets, there are five dwarf planets. And here are all eight primary planets, their familiar friends now, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The first four planets are rocky planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are rocky planets. The four planets furthest from the Sun are the gas planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are gas planets. Hey, when is it going to be my turn? I want to be in this compilation video too. Okay, let's see. I'm going to teach about pollination. 
Hi, look at all these beautiful flowers that I've found. Let's look at some more. These flowers are so pretty. Look at how bluey, purpley they are. They're just so beautiful. And these ones are so red and... <gasps> oh, excuse me. These ones are so red and brilliant. Achoo! And look at all the pretty colors. Achoo! It's so... Achoo! It's so beautiful. I love these flowers, but all the pollen is making me sneeze and sniffly. So I think we should go back inside. Alright, that's better. Well, flowers, they make pollen, and pollen is a fine powder. It's usually yellow, and it can make you sneeze, just like me earlier. Flowers use pollen to make seeds through a process called pollination. Okay, do you see these yellow feathery parts of the flower? This is the male part of the flower called the stamen, and that is where the pollen is made. Now this middle pink part of the flower is called the pistil, which is the female part of the flower. This is where the pollen needs to go so the flower can make seeds. Looking at this flower, do you think the yellow parts are the stamen or the pistil? That's right, that's the stamen. The stamen is the male part of the flower. That's the part that makes pollen. Now here's a different flower. Do you think this purple part in the middle is the stamen or the pistil? Very good, that's the pistil. The pistil is the female part of the flower where the pollen needs to go so that the flower can make seeds. When pollen is moved from the stamen to the pistil, it is called pollination. There are flowers that have both a stamen and a pistil, but there are some flowers that have only a pistil, and there are other flowers that have only a stamen. Pollen can't move by itself, so how will it get to the pistil? With the help of pollinators. Do you recognize this well-known pollinator? Very good, that's a honeybee. Honeybees are pollinators, and you can see the yellowy-orange pollen on his leg right here. Pollinators are pollen helpers by moving the pollen to the pistil so the flower can make seeds. Let's look at some other pollinators. Do you know what this pollinator is called? That's right, this is a butterfly. And this one is called a painted lady butterfly. Butterflies are pollinators. What kind of animal is this? That's right, that's a bat. This is a flying fox, which is a fruit bat. And fruit bats are pollinators too. What's this little guy called? Great job, this is a hummingbird. It's a ruby-throated hummingbird. And hummingbirds are also pollinators. Other pollinators include wasps and moths. Ants and beetles like this ladybug are pollinators too. These other pollinators are very well known. They are bumblebees and honeybees. All right, let's review what we've learned today. What is the fine yellow powder on this bee called? That's right, it's pollen. Pollen is a fine yellow powder. This yellow part of the flower makes pollen. Do you remember what it's called? That's right, that's the stamen. The stamen is the male part of the flower. That's the part that makes pollen. Why do flowers use pollen? Great job! Flowers use pollen to make seeds. 
This purple part of the flower is where the pollen needs to go so the flower can make seeds. Do you remember what it's called? Very good, that's the pistil. The pistil is the female part of the flower where the pollen needs to go so that the flower can make seeds. What is the process called when pollen is moved from the stamen to the pistil? Great job! When pollen is moved from the stamen to the pistil, it is called pollination. What is the name of the pollen helpers who move the pollen so the flower can make seeds? That's right, they're called pollinators. Pollinators are pollen helpers by moving the pollen to the pistil so the flower can make seeds. Now you know how the flowers around you make more flowers. Pollinators help them through a process called pollination so they can make seeds. Wow, you completed the video. That is so impressive. Well, you might notice there's a circle right here on this video page that you can click to subscribe to our channel or you can click this rectangle to go to another one of our videos. But keep learning. Learning is so cool.